Alright, I shall now call upon the next speaker, who is Mr. Lee Ka Jing. He is again a very concerned young Singaporean. He is a father of two. Right? He works as an actuary. And he is concerned enough to come to stand on our platform today. Mr. Lee. Just a lot of people. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I was just wondering, I, I'm very concerned. The government keeps saying we need to communicate our policies. I apologize. <laughs> I'm very concerned. The government keeps saying we need to communicate our policies better. Have they actually thought it's not about communication, communicating their policies better? Maybe we don't even like the policies in the first place. Yeah. How many ways do you want to com com communicate? 6.9 million. How, how many ways? You can do by one. <laughs> Is it like that? Okay, but right now I want to get into more details with the issues I have with the white paper. First, the population strategy, the population strategy outlined in the white paper is short-sighted and dangerous. Depend depending on foreigners as the main mainstay of our population strategy is unstable. Singapore will need to be able to attract them in sufficient numbers and quality only if we can pay them significantly higher wages. And we know that these developing countries, China, India, even Myanmar and Vietnam, that, um, even Myanmar and Vietnam, they are doing big things with their economy. Their income is fast catching up. In, in 30 years time, 20 years time, if we can do it in 30 years time, we cannot write them, write them out. We may not have the luxury of importing unlimited amount of foreign workers. That's even if the white paper is right in the first place. And <clears throat> currently, in uh, uh, the GDP per capita in cities like Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Mumbai, and New Delphi ranges from 8K USD to 12K USD. It's a matter of time before they'll catch up to us. Do you think that the foreign workers will take a train to work in Shanghai or, or come all the way to Singapore? It is not sustainable, my friends. We develop new water, we reclaim land, we encourage hydroponic farming to enhance our national security. There's no reason to bet our national vitality on the uncertain availability of foreign workers. If you want to bet, do it in a casino. Don't bet with our lives. In the white paper to backfire massively. If and will and we will encounter a national crisis, a prolonged one, foreigners may no longer find our country attractive and worthwhile to work in. If we continue on our current path without encouraging, without increasing fertility rate, we will not have the core Singaporeans to rebuild Singapore, rebuild Singapore. And we don't need 2024 20, sight to see that. Crises occur from time to time. We will need Singaporean. We can never depend on external resources to deal with them. As our population balloon, an ever smaller segment of society, young Singaporean males, will perform national service as there will be increasingly more new citizens and PRs compared to young Singaporeans. National security will not be written just because of the shrinking pool of soldiers, but because the cultural institution of national service and total defense will be eroded. That's right! That's right! Even today, as we stand here with 5.3 million people, many parents are questioning the value of national service when a significant segment of society enjoys the benefits of the security yeah! that sons provide. Yeah! Yeah! Without contributing themselves, undermine national security. Secondly, another point I want to point out. Even if we put all our cultural, all the cultural, psychological, sustainability issues aside, the white paper is right in that a liberal population policy will allow more of our, will, will grow up the economy and allow more Singaporeans to move up the job ladder. This is true today and it will be true in the long run. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But we don't need to have so many people moving up the job ladder, going to PMAC jobs. If we don't, if we pay a decent wage 
to people doing manual work. If we pay a decent wage to people doing manual work, everybody will feel less stress and we'll have a more united Singapore. Yeah. And, the, and, and the white paper, one, one issue the white paper did not address is how, how are we going to deal with our increasing inequality, inequality gap? The, 20, the bottom 20% has, has it very hard in recent years. The prices keep going. Oh, I apologize. Prices, prices, prices keep going up year after year, but salaries are not catching up for the bottom 20%. Yeah. There is nothing in the white paper that reassures the 20, bottom 20% 20 of Singaporeans that they will be looked after. I would like to quote some num I would like to quote some numbers, some uh, the Gini, some Gini index number from World Bank. They are available from Wikipedia, so I'm not making this up. Okay, Sweden, a uh, famously egalitarian society, has and has a Gini index of uh, 0.25. Korea, many of us have been to Korea before. We know what it's like. We watch our dramas and everything. 0.31. Russia, 0.4. Philippines. 0.43 Singapore 0.48 Where Where do we go from here? Do Singaporeans want to live in such an unequal society? No! The answer is no But the white paper is silent on this There is a disconnect between what the government and the people perceive as quality of life It is not only about infrastructure or economic growth. For most Singaporeans, a high quality of life means having the opportunity of living better than their parents. Yep. Job security without relentless competition from all directions. Perhaps even a family car after you start a family and have children. Where Singaporeans with less resources and income can live a dignified life. There's frustration from the people because our leaders have not shown much creativity and top leadership in a white paper and through, subsequent, and through subsequent debate. There's too little focus to increase fertility rate, which should be our number one priority. Yes, yes. There's too little focus to help marginalized segments of society catch up and reduce inequality. Ultimately, we need a vision of Singapore where most Singaporeans can support and fight for. Yeah. What are the alternative long-term solutions? <laughs> we need absolute national focus on birth rate and not immigration. Yeah! Yeah! The population white paper should be called the immigration white paper actually. Because <laughs> there's, there's only maybe five sentences on the population, which is the people here today. Why are you not working on the people here today and hoping for the people tomorrow? Immigration must always remain plan B or even plan C. Raising birth, rate, raising birth rates can be done. Some Nordic countries found what worked work for them and has and have done, and have done it. We need to be bold and creative in finding effective policies to combat our low fertility rate. We need policies that target what young people and parents care about and encourage people who wish to get married to be able to do so and do so earlier. And people who love children to have more children. So what is the government currently doing about it? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Our current marriage and parenthood package help relieve the financial stress of parenthood but does not encourage people to have more kids. I mean, I can support the compassion but the policy tool is too blunt to be effective. It, it just does not make sense. Each child will entitle parents to X dollars of money and Y dollars of tax relief. It reduces the cost of child-rearing in a linear fashion. Okay, let me give you an example. When my son is born, the moment I leave KK Hospital, the baby bonus is gone. <laughs> Correct? Yes. Yes. So, so, so you, you, you know what I'm trying to say? So you want to encourage people to have more, more children. But to them, I have more children immediately, the money is gone. Why? What was that? Tax relief. Many low-income families want to have more children. But there's no tax relief for them. Why? Because 
they make below the amount of income to be taxable. The 20,000 is, is, is a starting point when it's taxable. So if you make it for, for, for manual workers, too bad lah. I think a good start would be to segment our marriage and parenthood package for different social economic classes so that we can maximize fertility and help, look, help uh, give more help to lower income uh, families. We also need to work on key concerns for parents, what they are, education and cost of living. We need to have policies that, that turn the current situation upside down. Parents are worried to have more children, parents like myself are worried to have more children because we are worried we are not able to give a, give a good life. We are unable to give, not just a good life, we are worried like as we have more children, the standard of living of our, for our children and, the, and their future will be diminished. We need, to have to, we need to have incremental policies to help people with three children get an advantage so that they can move ahead in society. And we, of course, we need more work-life balance. We need minimum wage. Yes. We need anti-discrimination law yes. to give people more time to fall in love and confidence to get married and start a family. Yes. Yes. I have come to the end of my speech. I would like to thank Gilbert and his team of tireless workers for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you.